Chapter 52 Alexa Brenner Alexa Alexa A hand is on my arm shaking me awake. Opening my eyes, I look at Raylene. I'm not feeling good. I have to poop. It's just around the corner, take a candle with you. I close my eyes to try to go back to sleep. Can you take me? Please, I'm scared. I don't want to go alone. I can't say no to her begging. Okay. I get up. Crystal notices our movement and decides to follow us. Let's go. She grabs my hand. On the way out, I grab one of the candles in the hall. I take her to the washroom. She doesn't take long at all before she's done. Are you feeling any better? No. She shakes her head and pouts. Do you need to go back to the toilet? Raylene only answers me by shaking her head. Okay, then let's go back to bed and maybe you'll feel better in the morning. No, I don't want to. Can you read me a book? Raylene tries to delay having to go back to bed. I'm tired and I want to go back to bed. I don't want to deal with this right now. A good timing yawn from her helps me. No come on sweetie, we should go back to bed. You're so tired, you're yawning. No, I want story time. Raylene raises her voice and throws her fists to her sides. I'll read you a book in the morning. We don't want to disturb the people sleeping in the library. Now, let's go back to bed. I raise my voice to go over hers. I don't want to. No. She is almost at a full-blown temper tantrum now. Her screams must be waking people from how loud she's being. Crystal tries to back her up by growling at me. You don't act like this. What is wrong with you? We are going back to bed and that's final. I scream at her, trying to scold her. No. Raylene screams as loud as I'm sure she can. What is going on here? I jump from Miles' voice suddenly behind me. Raylene runs past me and grabs onto Miles. I don't feel good. I don't want to go back to bed. Her small voice is back. Raylene wavers like she's on the edge of crying. He touches the top of her head. You said you want story time, right? How about you and Alexa go to the cafeteria and I'll get a book? Just one book and then it's back to bed. Okay. Raylene nods her head. She doesn't let go of him until he picks her up and carries her out of the bathroom. Crystal follows right after them. We go downstairs to the cafeteria. I grab her a bottle of water on our way in. Miles sets her down on a tabletop. I'll be right back. He runs off. I open the bottle and hand it to her. She drinks a bit and gives it back. I put the cap back on and set it on the table beside her. We say nothing. I don't know what to say to her. Why is she acting like this? It doesn't take long for Miles to come back. He doesn't have a book with him. We have to go. He looks panicked. The mall is being attacked. We've got to go now. Standing up I turn around and pick Raylene up. Even with the extra weight, I still can run a lot faster than she ever could. We run out one side of the cafeteria and towards the doors to the outside. Someone yells. The mall is under attack get up. Everyone wake up. We need to escape. Miles tries for the next nearest exit point, but before we even get there people run past us. Don't go that way. A chilling scream comes from that hall. We run towards where the rest had gone. Fire lights up the ceiling. I hear someone yell, dragons. I spot the first demon after it drops down from the upper floor. I have no idea what it is. It doesn't look human, with its horns, elongated head and long body. The blue skin almost looks black in the lack of light. The demon grabs someone running by. 
Opening its mouth, which takes up half its face, it bites her head off. The crunch sickens me. Miles charges the demon. It jumps out of the way, onto the railing. There is a knife in the demon's chest. It growls at Miles when he charges the demon again. It grabs Miles in both of its arms. Kelly comes from above and with a sword in hand, she cuts off the demon's arms. It falls back into the water as the arms fall away from Miles. Kelly says something to Miles before he comes over to us. Theater exit. Make it to the trucks. I nod though it's useless. He's already turned away and started running. Going after him down the hallway, we get quite a ways. We make it to the doors and outside. Climbing the stairs to the upper floor. The cold air hurts my lungs but I keep running until we get to the moving truck. There are multiple vehicles to choose from but this one has a cover over it. The other trucks are sticking people in the back with no protection. I get Raylene in first, then myself. Crystal jumps up beside us and snuggles into Raylene. People run over being led by James. Nikki stops her approach. I look at Crystal and her sudden screech. A thud makes me look back outside. A dragon has landed right behind the truck with Sandra riding on top. Nikki screams. Darius grabs her then jumps and lands on the back of the dragon with Nikki in his arms. The dragon spreads its wings. It jumps up, flaps its wings, and is gone. James gets into the back with a few others and yells, That's it Miles, let's go. Everyone hold on. He waits to close the door until after we start to move. I crouch to the cold floor and grab onto a railing. Raylene is now on the ground, but still clutched to my side. Why did he take her? I ask quietly. Darius was here, a few meters away, and decided to take Nikki. Why her? Who is she? James asks everyone. Out of everyone, what would Darius and Sandra want with Nikki? No one offers up anything. They look around to each other for an answer and shrug and shake their heads. Is she working with them? No. One of her male friends defends her. I've known her most of our lives, there's no way she would be working with them. James puts his hand up to concede and hush the friend. We have to assume it's important then. They attach tonight specifically to take her. Why would they do that? I don't know. He admits. We should attack the farm tonight, Kelly announces. We don't have anything near the numbers we had. But they won't be expecting us. We can guerrilla warfare from the forest. It's too soon. We have to assume she's important to something. What if this is our last chance before their plan becomes irreversible? They're still attacking them all. There won't be as many people at the farm. Miles, head to the farm, James yells up to Miles. She's right. This could be our best chance. Does anyone have paper and something to write with? I think there's something in the glove box. Miles shouts over the noise of the thundering walls. James goes past everyone to join Miles up front. Open the crates. There should be a crate of weapons and armor somewhere. James shouts to the back. Various people get up and open the crates, then hand things out. I stay with Raylene and just let them work. They hand out food and a weapon first. The armor will be handed out when people can change without falling over. After everyone settles we sit in silence until we pull into a long driveway surrounded by trees. I assume we're at the neighboring farmhouse. James comes to the back with papers clutched in his hands. Once we stop no one speaks, just go into the house. Find a place to settle and wait for further instructions. He hands me a paper. Some of you will get papers, others won't. He hands Raylene a piece. James hands the last paper out just as the truck and the noise stops. Kelly pulls up the door. All the other trucks park shortly after us.
James jumps out the back and goes to the closest pickup. I get up, pick up my blades and jump out. Seeing the height of some of the snow where we will need to walk, I grab Raylene out of the back and carry her. The snow chills my ankles and clings to my pants as high as my knee. Kelly goes in the front door so I follow her. I let Raylene down once we hit the covered deck. I stomp my feet on the deck to shake off some of the snow. Crystal leaps onto the deck and shakes off a bunch of the snow. The house is almost as cold as outside. I set down my weapons by the fireplace. I know Raylene is cold so the first thing I do is search for a closet or a bedroom with blankets. To the right of the entrance is a hallway with three bedrooms and a bathroom. I pull all of the sheets off the beds and bring them into the living room to wrap around Raylene. A couple of people get the same idea and pull more blankets and towels to wrap up in. The better. I ask her. She nods back to me with a small smile. I pull the pieces of paper out of my pocket. The first one says, stay at the abandoned farmhouse. Flipping it open the second one I find an ominous, come see me. That can't be good. I assume Raylene's is the first and mine is the latter. I tell Raylene, I'll be right back. Stay here. Keep warm. James is sitting at the kitchen table discussing something with Miles. I walk the few meters up to them. Have a seat, James says without looking at me. He moves a piece of paper and a pencil to me. He hushes his voice, I need you to tell me everything you saw there. How many people? Draw me a map of the farm. A layout of the house. My mind is filled with the different memories of the place all at once. I start drawing the house in the middle of the paper. Just a box with an L, shape of the outside to show the deck. Um. There are three floors. Ram and Sandra babysat us. Darius came in every once in a while. Shale too. But no one else was at the house. I think they stayed elsewhere. Oh, there were hobgoblins in the basement. How many entrances? James asks. Two. One on the main floor and the other is in the basement. I place darker lines on the square showing where the doors would be. He points to the door on the right side of my drawing. Is this door hidden by the deck? Yes, it faces the forest and you can't see it from much of the road. I draw the road coming out from the toy barn in front of the house, winding around to the back of the farm. Next, I draw a couple of quick trees to show where the forest would be. Do you know where they would put Nikki? James asks. They'd probably put her in the room beside Sandra's upstairs. Or, maybe the bedroom on the main floor. I set back to working on the map while James talks. I draw the toy barn, the open field near the house, the hill gets labeled, the slaughterhouses and the barn in the back. Good. We have to be as quick as possible. Since you know the house layout, you'll be in charge of rescuing her from the house. While we take care of them, you need to get Nikki out of there and back here. James notices my map. What is this? He points his finger over the area with the slaughterhouses and barn. Part of the farm too. Darius and Shale took Raylene and me to the barn to see the griffins back there. I saw the slaughterhouse while we were there. Oh. I draw a pathway and a pond somewhere in the forest. We went to this pond and saw a dragon too. Damn. I didn't know the area was so large. He thinks for a moment. Is this all? I look at the map for a moment. Yes. Okay. I'll be back in a moment. He takes my map with him. I turn in my seat. He doesn't go far. James says something to King Zircon. Nodding to James, he starts gathering the dwarves telling them to go outside and to prepare to leave in two minutes. James comes back to the table. Can I see the pencil? I hand it to him. James boxes out an area on the map and labels it dwarves. 
The area covers a third of the map, the areas in and around the toy barn, the field, and the pond. He names the house, Us. James gets up and goes downstairs without another word. He returns a moment later with a herd of people following after him. They go out the front door while James comes back to the table. He sections off most of the rest of the farm, excluding the slaughterhouses. This gets labeled K and D. The large section is named Rest. James looks up, Daniel, you're not going with them. Kelly, come here. She jumps over the couch and stairway and lands in the kitchen beside Miles. Take Daniel back here to the slaughterhouses. Free everyone you find there. Kill anyone that tries to stop you. Kelly looks at Daniel with a disgusted glare. I get a feeling that if he doesn't return it will probably be because of friendly fire. Daniel's face goes white and I think he just had the same thought. Kelly walks past him, grabbing his shirt and making him follow as she stomps out of here. Almost everyone is gone now. Only Raylene, two unknown people that came from the mall, Tim and his parents remain in the living room. From the lack of noise, I assume that everyone else has left, except us at the table. We'll be leaving in about five minutes. That will give them all the time the others need to get into place. James informs us. We're doing this right now. The words explode from my mouth. I had thought that was what was going on, but hearing it still comes as a surprise. I wish I could take the words back as soon as everyone starts staring at me. Yes. Say your goodbyes and get ready. I get up immediately. Raylene must have been listening because she is already on her way over to me. She latches onto my waist. Don't go away like mommy and daddy did. Her eyes are puffy and tears stream down her cheeks. My mind blanks. What do I say to her? I can't guarantee that I won't die. I can't guarantee that I will come back to her. My eyes blur towards the bottom. Miles kneels beside us. Raylene, I promise that I will protect her and make sure she comes back. Okay. She lifts her head off of me enough to look at him. Okay. Up. Her arms loosen briefly while I pick her up, only to wrap around my neck. I take her back over to the couch. Miles and James grab their things quickly and go to the door while I tuck her into the blankets. I kiss her lips. I'll be back in a few hours. Get some sleep. I love you. I'll miss you. I love you too, Raylene. I won't be gone long. Kissing her on the top of her head, I can't look at her anymore, so I turn around and I grab my weapons off the ground and go meet Miles and James outside. I close the door behind me. Are you okay? Miles asks me. I take a deep breath before answering. Let's just go. On our walk, I try to scrub the goodbye from my memory. Focus on the upcoming battle so I can return safe and sound. Focus on what's going on around me so I'm not caught off guard. We don't say anything as we travel through the dark and quiet forest. I can't see too far in front of me, but Miles and James seem to know exactly where they are going. I keep close to James to make sure first don't get lost. My footsteps are loud against the silence and for a few meters I try to make them quieter, but it doesn't help. Finally, I see some lights in the distance. James slows down the pace. He seems to be hiding behind trees at some points, so I fall into step right behind him. Miles takes his own path. A few meters from the tree line we stop and crouch behind some bushes. Miles grabs onto a nearby tree and scales up it. We sit and wait. I don't know for how long. James busies himself by looking around us. I can't see Miles up in the tree. We wait. My legs cramp up so I kneel down. The moment I do I feel wetness seep into my pants. I get back up. While there is no snow where we are, there must have been some earlier. The ground is cold and wet. 
A boom sounds in the distance right, before I see the orange glow of a flame. James takes off. It takes Miles grabbing my hand and pulling me up before I realize that is probably a sign that something's happening. When did he get down out of the tree? We run across the short space between the tree line and the house. James doesn't wait for us to open the door and he heads into the basement. It doesn't take long for us to reach the entrance. Miles stops me outside the door. Stay. He goes inside. I can hear the tiny footsteps and whispers. I'm unsure the shiver up my spine is from the cold or the chilling sound. I am blinded for a moment. The basement light turns on. The hobgoblins screech from the light. I hide further behind the doorway. Miles pulls out his sword and slices the creatures in half. James stops one from running. It floats into the air and slams into a nail on the stairway. Ram is halfway down the stairs by the time I notice anyone coming down them. There are two other sets of feet coming down them. Somehow, I don't think I will be able to get by three people. There is another entrance though. Before any of them could realize I am here, I back away from the basement entrance. Turning around I look for anyone that could be coming down the path. There are a few people there fighting but no one would be paying attention to me. I hug against the deck wall to peek around the corner. Everyone is fighting. Taking the chance I run, around the deck and up the stairs. The front door was left wide open in someone's rush. Avoiding the basement door I go through the kitchen way. I almost fall as I trip over something. Looking down it was a small leg. My eyes drift up the lifeless body. I take a deep breath. Back to my job. I go through the living room and up the stairs. I don't hesitate for a second to go straight to my room. Opening the door and rushing it all in the same movement to come face to face with Nikki, thrusting a broken chair leg at me. A little scream escapes. Nikki's reflexes help her to stop before she hits me. Noises float up from the basement battle. Someone sounds like they just about went through the floorboards. Time isn't something we can waste here. I tell her, let's go. I run out ahead of her back down the path I came through. I'm a bit quicker this time. I feel like this is a home run from this point. Rushing out the door and around to the side of the building, I stop for a brief moment. Ram, Shale, Miles and James are all still fighting. I pull out the dagger I had placed through my belt loop and hand it to Nikki. Pointing towards the forest, she gets the idea that we need to go and starts running. She's faster than me. She makes it into the tree line before seeing that I am falling behind. Nikki slows her speed only a little, but it is enough for me to catch up. In a blink, she is thrown to the ground and my neck is being gripped by a cold hand. I can't breathe through the pain and Darius squeeze. Tears roll down my cheeks. I can't get any air into my lungs. Staring into his eyes, there is something different about him. His eyes have darkened. His skin looks ashen and sunken in, even in the lack of light. Lips and teeth smack with mine. More pain. Liquid drips down my chin before his tongue laps it up. Floating for a split second before I hit the ground. I gulp for air. Darius walks over to Nikki and picks her off the ground. I can only look at him for a moment before he disappears as fast as he appeared. Still gasping in the air, I get up with the help of a tree. I pick up the dropped dagger. Steadying myself I run back towards the farmhouse. Swiping my hand across my chin and lips I pull it away immediately wishing I hadn't, my lips sting and blood is now on the palm on my hand. I rub it on the stomach of my shirt. Getting to the door frame I quickly stop myself. Darius got Nikki, I yell to James and Miles. Shit. Ram is in front of me. He pushes me to the side. I fall unbalanced and land on a pile of cut up wood. Ram runs towards the front of the house. Shale runs after him in a blur. Miles comes out next. He helps me stand up. 
My lips itch, but the blood flow stops. He turns back through the doors. I make it there in time to see someone fly across and into the wall. Something cracks. I'm not sure whether it was from the wall or the person or even both. They don't move. I'm sure they're dead. James looks at me. Are you okay? Yes, I say automatically though I am not sure at the moment. I must look awful. My neck has probably bruised and I have my own blood everywhere. There is a loud roar from a crowd of people outside. I go to take a look. James and Miles follow behind me as a crowd of people run down the path. They go out in front of the house where the demons are fighting the dwarves. Some I recognize but there are many I don't. They're closing the area of the battle. The extra people from the slaughterhouse must have decided to help us. James and Miles rush to help. I stay here. It's a debate for me on whether I should go help or stay behind. We seem to be winning. More of them are being killed than us. Before I can change my mind I run towards them. I ready my dagger to stab someone when I get there. Just out of my view I see something rush towards me. I stop. A wolf humanoid creature blocks me from the rest of the battle. It snarls and growls at me. It stands up on its hind legs and walks towards me. Frozen in my spot I tighten my grip on the dagger. Kelly's brief lesson rings in my head, aim for the heart and head. My eyes go to where its heart should be. I focus on that. It lunges towards me. My hand goes forward and hits something hard. I let go of the dagger lodged in its chest and move out of the way. It slumps down to all fours and growls. Keeling over to its side, it stops breathing. I need my dagger back. It was dumb to have let go of it. I cautiously walk over to it. Watching for any signs of movement, I grab the hilt of the dagger and pull. I turn around. One of the blue demons at the mall has its mouth open ready to bite my head off. A blade slices quickly through the opened mouth. The sword pulls out and Miles pushes the body to the side to fall. Are you okay? He asks. Yes. I hear flapping above. Looking up I see a dragon. We leave now. Darius yells out to his group. The battle was won by us but not completely. They still have Nikki. My heart stops when I hear Raylene scream. Sandra holds Raylene on top of the dragon. They are at enough of an angle I can see Nikki on it too. Raylene? I scream. Sandra looks at me and laughs deeply. The dragon starts flying back in the direction of the abandoned house. I run after them. There is no hope. Miles passes me. I stop at the tree line. Miles has disappeared and the dragon is far off in my view. James comes up behind me. It's no use, Alexa. Miles has gone after them. You won't be able to catch them. Come back and help. We have many injured that need to be moved into the house. I hear the words but half of them don't make sense in my mind. Come on. He wraps his arm around my shoulder to gild me to the house. Go into the washrooms and see if you can find any type of first aid supplies. Bring it into the living room. There's a dead body in there. The words come out in all one tone, escaping as I think them. James turns around and orders people from his place on the deck. Everyone who is injured please go around the side to the basement door. If you can help those who are more injured than yourself. He turns back around to me and ushers me into the house. Go find the supplies I will take care of the body. I start in the bathroom just down the hall. Rifling through the cupboards I find a large tin filled with a thrown together first aid kit. I grab that and the few towels that are hung up. The bathroom doesn't have much else. Backing out I spot the soap and grab that as well. The lights to the basement are still on. The stairs don't look like they were damaged at all from the fight, but I still go down cautiously. 
people are already starting to make the basement into a makeshift hospital. Some blankets are being laid on the concrete and some are laying on them. I am swarmed as soon as I reach the floor. The supplies are taken from my arms. I go all the way upstairs to the second bathroom. There is nothing in this one except a few towels and soap. I look in the mirror. I look like I belong in a horror movie. Drying blood covers my chin and the front of my sweater. Taking the sweater off, I turn it around and use the back of the shirt to clean myself. I turn on the tap enough to wet the cloth and start rubbing the blood away. It takes a bit of work to get most of it off, but it doesn't take long. I grab the towels and the soap and return to the basement. Few people notice me this time. They are busy helping to bandage people up. James is delegating people different tasks, go boil water, we need to sterilize, rip the bedsheets up for more bandages, go to the abandoned farmhouse for more first aid supplies. People take the soap and towels. I just stand here. Watch the chaos around me. Miles has come back. He walks towards me. There's no Raylene. How are you doing? Miles asks as he reaches out to touch my arm. How do you think? Knocking his hand away from me, I don't want his touch right now. He gets upset with my actions. I'm sorry. I couldn't catch up to them. They were going too fast. But I swear as soon as we are able, we'll go look for her. Now, he makes me feel worse. I shouldn't have thrown his hands back like that. I should have stayed with her. Miles shakes his head. Then you might have been captured too. I can't handle this conversation any longer. It's my fault. If I hadn't left Raylene alone, we'd still be together. I turn away from Miles and go back up the stairs. The upstairs bathroom calls my name. I close the door behind me. I look through the drawers. I find a pair of scissors. The edge might be sharp enough. I set the toilet seat down. Putting the scissors down on the counter, I undo the button on my pants and pull them down to my shins. I sit down on the cold toilet seat. Griping the scissors in my left hand, I look at them. They call to me. I sob. Hot tears cool quickly. My heart races so hard my chest hurts. Apprehensive of what I'm about to do, I hesitate. I know I shouldn't do it, but confusingly it helps me. I open the scissors up and run the blade against the skin of my thighs. Lighter at first, I make white lines on my skin. The blade isn't sharp enough that the small amount of pressure even would break my skin. I swipe the blade across harder and harder. Finally, a bead line of blood is drawn. My hands shake from the sight. Not in fear but pleasure. The blood releases my hurt, it makes me feel better. Scars from my previous sessions remind me how addicting this feeling is. I tire of swiping once I get a few lines drawn. Closing up the scissors, I put my hand in it to get a better grip. Pushing together a bit of skin, I open the scissors and snip a tiny circle of skin off. And again. And again. And again. Finally satisfied with my bloody art, I put the scissors down on the counter. I watch the blood for a bit. Tearing some toilet paper off the roll, I set to cleaning up the mess. The bloody tissues go onto the counter. The second batch of toilet paper gets a quick douse of cold water. It soothes the burn when I touch it to the wounds. Once the bleeding has pretty much stopped and all the blood is cleaned up I stand up. I pull my pants up carefully. I feel much the same now but more in control. A numbness creeps in. I wash the scissors in the sink and put them back in the drawer. The tissues go into the toilet and I flush them away. The makeup I had used previously is still in here. I do up my whole face in the makeup routine I love, foundation, mascara, eyeliner, purple eyeshadow, blush, and light red lipstick. Ready to face the outside I unlock the door. One deep breath and I open the door. No one is on this level, but I can hear some people have gone into the living room, a floor down. 
Not wanting to deal with anyone else, I go the other way into my room. Stepping over the broken chair, I go to the dresser to change into my own clothes. Nikki's notebook sits on top. I'll keep it with me. Make sure I can get it back to her. I open up the drawers to the cabinet and my clothes are still there. I pull out a pajama set and get dressed in fresh clothes. The shorts barely cover my new wounds but they do well enough. The tank top is cold so I grab a sweater as well to go over top. Exhaustion makes my head fuzzy. I pull the covers on the bed up and get in. I hug the one pillow to myself and lay my head on the other.